you, you look at the milk aisle and probably many of us look at it and say, that's, that's, I think that's natural. Like that aisle there, as far as natural, unadulterated food, it must be dairy. It's one of the most adulterated things in the grocery store. Hi everyone, now this is part two of my interview with Dr. Bill Schindler. Dr. Bill Schindler, he is a modern day Indiana Jones. He's a food archeologist and the author of How to Eat Like a Human. In this interview, we talk all things dairy and why the dairy in the grocery aisle has been completely adulterated. And the one thing that you guys can do to make sure that your dairy is safe to consume and full of nutrition. Now support is very important on this carnival and health journey. And that's why I have a community open 24 seven with the best carnival and medical experts to help you along your health journey. The first being Steak and Butter Gal, Bella. And we're gonna be doing that in August. So make sure that you guys join in the first link in the description. There's also weekly live streams talking all things health, movement, sleep, meditation, to make sure that you guys are successful. Okay, without further ado, let's get into all things dairy with Dr. Bill Schindler. Now, from an evolution point of view, I know that you have very interesting perspectives in terms of dairy, how we were consuming it, and the problems with dairy now. 100%. To, to start off, we humans have one of the least efficient digestive tracts of any animal on the planet. It is incredibly difficult for us to safely and efficiently derive nutrition from the raw materials in our environment, no matter what they are. Humans are not designed to eat almost every food that we consume. So what's, what the hard part to articulate is we built our bodies, the bodies that you and I have right now and our ancestors' bodies are built on the backs of foods that we absolutely have absolutely no business eating. Dairy is something completely different. The cool thing about dairy is it is, in my mind, the one food that our species is perfectly designed to consume, but only for a brief period of our lives when we're infants. So human infants, because we're mammals, are perfectly designed to consume raw dairy from our mothers. After we get weaned from our mothers, us, just like all other mammals, lose the ability to um, efficiently and safely digest dairy. Now that doesn't mean that we can't include dairy as a nourishing part of our diets as adult humans. I, I truly believe we can, and I'm gonna tell you how, but it's just like every other food. Like, we are not designed to jump on animals on the African savannah and rip them apart with these, you know, lacking these huge canines and the same. But we built our bodies, our species on the backs of including animals in our diet because we had technological advancements like bows and arrows and atlatls and knives to butcher and fire to cook and all, all of those sorts of things. So dairy is no different. If we can uh, uh, process the dairy the same way as adults outside of our body that we could as infants inside of our body, then I believe we can safely, and, and, and we do, and in our family we do. So this is what happens when we're infant humans consuming milk directly from our mothers. And there's a couple of very important uh, points here. One is that milk that's coming from our mothers is teeming with live bacteria, and when it leaves our mother's breast, it is already in the process of fermentation. It is also at body temperature. And I know that sounds strange, like, why is that important? Well, it's important because the bacteria that are, uh, the important bacteria, the lactobacillus bacteria that's uh, necessary for the proper fermentation is designed to operate at that temperature. So when we're drinking from our mothers, you have this live bacteria fermenting this milk that's coming into our digestive tracts. And we as infant humans produce several different enzymes to help us safely and efficiently digest that milk. One is lipase, which helps break down the fats in the milk. One is lactase, which helps break down the sugars in the milk. And uh, one is, well, as humans, it's a chyme. It's a, it's a couple of different enzymes. Uh, if there's other mammals, it's chymosin, but it's, it's these other enzymes that impact the proteins that are in the, um, in the dairy, in the milk, and help the milk sort of come together and coagulate. All of these processes are very important. We have to break down the sugar, the lactose, right? With, with lactase, we have to break down the fats and we have to slow the milk down because when we're infant humans and all infant, all, uh, infant mammals, if all we're doing is, is consuming a liquid, liquids pass through our digestive tract way too fast for us to fully break them down chemically and physically and also for the nutrients to be absorbed through our intestinal walls. 
So what nature's figured out is if we coagulate it and have it come together and be sort of a semi-solid, it slows it down. Um, it, our stomachs and, uh, and the enzymes and acids and things can, can work on it and break it down chemically and physically. It stays there a little bit longer. It stays there a little bit longer, continues to ferment. And then it goes into our small intestines and the nutrients, now that they're broken down into the right state, can now be absorbed through our intestinal walls. When we start to consume solids, many of us think, I believe, lactose intolerance is a weird thing. 65% of, of modern adult humans are lactose intolerant. In fact, it's weird for those of us who are lactose tolerant as adults. And those of us who are lactose tolerant as adults have ancestry back to either a couple places in Europe or a couple places in Africa where dairy was such an important part of the diet for such a long period of time that there were independent mutations that allowed us to produce our lactase into adulthood. So um, number one, we don't produce lactase. So we have to deal with the lactose in the milk is one issue. So what do we do? What, what do we do to safely and efficiently consume dairy in, as part of a nourishing diet as a modern human? Well, we replicate that entire process. Number one, we get the most high quality raw milk as possible. That's not the only thing, but that's, that's one of them. So high quality raw milk, um, and we ferment it. It's not how it's do not we fermenting. do that? How do we do that? Well, <laughs> there's a couple ways this? to do it. Okay. So, uh, number one, if you have access to increase now, remember there, uh, we can, uh, we'll talk a little bit about pasteurization and, and homogenization in, in a minute. Uh, but raw milk, the, you know, there's there are dangers with raw milk if it's bad raw milk. I do believe the safest, most nourishing dairy on the planet is fermented high quality raw dairy, but bad raw dairy is bad raw dairy. Okay, so there, there is a difference. So know your farmer, understand how they're treating their animals, make sure what you're getting is fresh. But if you have access to fresh raw dairy that's coming out of that animal, cow, sheep, goat, whatever, and it's coming out at, at body temperature, all you have to do is put it in a container and let it sit out for 24 hours, 12 to 24 hours. It will spontaneously ferment because it's already fermenting and produce something called clabber. Clabber is awesome, a fermented dairy product. So we're doing what we did as, as infants. We're doing it in a, in a bowl or a jar on our countertops. We can also make things like yogurt, kefir, um, and high quality traditional cheeses are all examples of fermented dairy. Now, when we refrigerate our dairy, you can improve the shelf life of that dairy by putting it in a refrigerator for days or, or, or a week or so to, if it's raw dairy. The problem is, and this is, this is weird, um, is that when we refrigerate it, we slow down all the microbial activity inside of that, but we slow it down at different rates. The bacteria that are designed to operate at body temperature really become dormant. And there's other bacteria in there that aren't designed to operate at that temperature. And they're not necessarily all good bacteria. So believe it or not, even though everything's slowed down, some of the bacteria that is, can do tolerate lower temperatures a little bit better, start to get an upper leg. So um, if you're going to ferment the dairy, the best time to do it is in, within the first couple of days because the dominant good bacteria is still dominant, you know, dominant in there. High quality raw milk does not go bad. It only sours. It turns into clabber and other things. So wow. uh, we've spent time with traditional groups. West Pocot Africa is a great example where they make something called the ash yogurt, Mersic, um, and they just let their dairy ferment and they eat it at, sometimes after a day and sometimes after several months, they just put it in put it in a gourd and sit it in the corner and then and eat it months and months later. Pasteurization uh, was the dairy industry in the late 1800s and early 1900s in the U S was so terrible that people were dying from really, really, really bad milk. Our government was faced with really um, two solutions to the problem. One was to transform the entire dairy industry, which was, you know, a huge undertaking uh, or they could, pasteurized the milk and they decided to pasteurize the milk and it's kind of stuck as a thing. Pasteurization doesn't make raw milk good. All pasteurization does is make it so that bad milk, I'm sorry, doesn't make bad milk good. Pasteurization just makes bad milk not kill somebody. It's still terrible okay. milk, right? Yeah. And, 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 but, it, but like, it's not going to kill you. So can you talk about what is pasteurization? 
what and why they actually do it for those that might not know at this time in the late 1800s early 1900s um cities were becoming much more developed in, in certain places places like new york city for example and a lot of the dairies were located on the outskirts of the city this is also a time when we didn't really have good control over refrigeration and uh, a lot of the dairies teamed up with distilleries because you know a distillery is using grains to you know, take in the grains they'd sprout the grains they would mash the grains they take out all the nutrition from the grains and they had all these leftover grains and it's like oh let's feed the cows the grains and then you know, could have a dairy right next to the distillery and this makes complete sense well it doesn't we shouldn't be feeding grain we know we shouldn't be feeding grain to dairy or to cows anyhow but here's grains where most of the nutrition has already been taken out of it to produce the alcohol. And so we're feeding them really empty nutrition of food they shouldn't have anyhow. And the sanitary conditions were terrible. If you read some of the reports, I mean, you have these cows that are standing elbow deep in their own feces and there's flies everywhere and there's dead cows laying next to live cows and they're milking the cows. And they talk about the color of the milk coming out was gray and green. And they were doing all sorts of things to change the color. There's even examples of them taking brains from animals and putting it in the milk because it really produces that bluish white color in the milk. And, you know, here's this milk without good refrigeration that's really bad going into the cities to feed these kids. Now, at the same time, there, were a, a, there was a, a huge reduction in breastfeeding. Uh, there was more women in the workforce than ever before. We didn't have the kind of refrigeration and breast pumps and things like that to store up milk to go. So kids were getting weaned off of their mothers at a much earlier age, which meant kids that were more vulnerable were accessing really terrible milk at an, early, you know, at an earlier age. And there were kids dying left and right from this, from this really bad milk. So something had to be done, don't get me wrong, but it, we have an industry that's doing bad things and they didn't change the industry. They just put a bandaid on a much larger problem. So pasteurization really essentially is just heating up the milk to kill everything off. And again, you heal it, everything it, good and bad. So all the good enzymes, good and bad. everything. Okay. So that's why it, there's lacking nutrients in the dairy that we have because of pasteurization, perhaps. It kills all the bacteria, good and bad. It, uh, destroys the enzymes, it uh, denatures the proteins, it kills vitamin A and vitamin D. So if you see, you know, for, uh, milk is fortified with vitamin A and vitamin D. It says it a lot of times on, on, on cartons. Well, the, it, it, you're not doing us any favors. You know, the vitamin A and the vitamin D were there. It got destroyed. You're artificially putting it back in. And to make matters worse, um, the dairy industry is also suggesting we should be drinking fat-free milk and yes. both vitamin A and vitamin D are fat soluble vitamins. So we've, we've taken a natural product, killed everything, made it devoid of most of its nutrition, uh, artificially put vitamin A and vitamin D back into it, and then are giving it to you without the fat needed to properly um, deal with deal with the vitamin A and vitamin D. I mean, it, it, the entire thing is insane. In fact, one of the, you, you look at the milk aisle, and probably many of us look at it and say that's that's i think that's natural like that aisle there as far as natural unadulterated food it must be dairy it's one of the most adulterated things in the grocery store it, it, it bears no resemblance to the kind of dairy our ancestors had for at least eight thousand years so um it's killing all that off and, and again for many of us who are sort of worried about bad bacteria and things here's how i visualize what's happening inside of that container of milk it's like two armies have met on a battlefield, you know, the good bacteria and the bad bacteria. And somebody dropped a bomb on the entire battlefield and killed both armies. So here you have this completely blank slate, just this empty field. That's the, um, the container of milk. It seems really safe and it is for a split second. But the problem is those good bacteria were fighting a really important battle for our health. And if, anything in that system breaks down from that point forward and any bad bacteria come in it's like the, now there's the reinforcements of the bad army coming out of that field and there's nothing to stop them and they can just run rampant so some people would suggest a pasteurized gallon of milk is you know incredibly safe and it doesn't have any bad bacteria so i mean you could maybe make that argument but it if anything gets into it it's one of the, the the worst recipes for disaster now and then pasteurization on top of that messes up the proteins so bad 
especially ultra pasteurized and ultra high temperature pasteurized that you know, the process I, i'm a cheese maker we make a lot of cheese here we make cheese we make yogurt we make cream cheese we make all sorts of things you can't use ultra pasteurized milk or ultra high temperature pasteurized milk to make those products it won't work the proteins are too screwed up and you might wonder well who cares i can't make i can't make milk with it well if what we're doing in the process of making yogurt kefir cheese whatever is replicating what happened naturally in our bodies when we safely and, and efficiently digest dairy if we can't even do that process with most of the milk in the grocery store, then I think we really need to be concerned about what it is we're putting into our bodies. Something's completely wrong. It can't go, really go through a lot of the digestive process that we needed to. And to make matters even worse is homogenization. Yes. Um, there, you could make an argument, again, that pasteurization maybe had its place in, in taking very bad milk and not you know, making it so it didn't kill a lot of people. Okay, and, and we already went through that. But there's absolutely no reason for homogenization there's well there's two reasons for homogenization and neither of them make any sense at all one is so that if anybody's ever had cream line milk or non-homogenized milk if you get up in the morning and you want to put milk in your coffee you get up and you grab the carton out of the out of the um, out of the fridge and you look at it and it's separated the cream has risen to the top it's a natural thing that happens and you have to shake the milk yes. right to get it in there so homogenization makes it so you don't have to spend 10 seconds shaking the carton the other thing that it does, and this is probably makes more, I guess, financial sense to the, to the dairy industry, is whole milk in this country, I don't know Australia's numbers, but I'm sure it's very similar, it has to have, I think, 3.2 or 3.4% fat. Fat, yeah. yeah. To 3 be called whole, whole milk. Yes. 3%. Yeah. Well, that's not what comes out of the cow. What comes yeah. out of the cow, depending on the cow breed and the season and all this, is much higher. High threes, sometimes it's, it's in the low fours, which means the dairy industry is skimming the fat, or literally skimming the fat off of the milk. Um, and really what happens is it's completely separated from the milk in the factory, and then it's put back together at the minimum amounts possible because there's a lot of money in the fat. They're going to tell you that um, it's, you know, don't eat the fat, don't eat the fat. But at the same time, they're making butter, they're making ice cream, they're selling you whole heavy cream, they're selling you half and half. The money's in the cream. So they're homogenizing the milk so you don't see how little fat is actually in the, the, the carton. And homogenization is incredibly dangerous for us because the way they do it is they take these, these steel plates with microscopic holes and they force the fat globules through these microscopic holes and they literally explode. And when they explode, they get smaller and they, um, they stay in suspension and they, you know, they don't rise to the top. Uh, but our bodies can't recognize it. It's, it's an artificial state of that fat that our bodies cannot recognize and do not know how to deal with. So if, if you're going to do anything with your dairy, definitely don't drink anything that's homogenized. If the pasteurization thing is still a huge leap for you um, to understand the importance of it. I completely get it. I understand we are all worried about safety and we want to make sure our families are as nourished as possible. I understand that. But there's no safety reason for homogenization. So get the cream line non-homogenized milk and at least take that one step uh, towards uh, or away from the, the the worst versions of the pasteurization. So if you're getting that shelf stable, ultra high temperature pasteurized milk that doesn't even have to sit in the refrigerator and it can sit on a shelf in a bag, yeah. um, maybe just get the ultra pasteurized or maybe just get the pasteurized and you know start to deal with that. That's at least a step, uh, certainly in the right direction. Okay, I have two questions from what you've just said. The first one, in terms of getting the fat uh, from the milk, so so they actually get the fat. First of all, should we should we not then be having any milk, and why don't we just have butter, cheese? Doesn't that make sense? Well, in drinking milk, yeah, I, I rarely drink any milk at all. Our family why should we drink milk? milk? Like, let's just not drink milk. I'm just, well, I mean, I, sorry, I, I, I'm just putting it out there in terms of no, no, I, questioning. I'm 100% on board with you. It is such an important question. We, you know, we've done a lot of work around the world with indigenous and traditional groups, and there's only two groups in the world that I know of that traditionally just consume milk, and it's the Samburu and the Maasai, and they drink a combination of raw milk and blood, uh, usually twice a day. And which when we did this with the Sumburo, it was fascinating. But the milk is raw. It is. 
Um, but they're just drinking the milk again with the, without fermenting it. Every other traditional group that I've read about, heard about, learned about, spent time with ferments their dairy. The fact that we have liquid unfermented milk in a container in our refrigerators and poured into a glass or poured into our coffee or God forbid poured onto our cereal it, it is a really strange, strange thing. So mm. you, you, you bring up a great point. Let me, and let me just give you an example of how powerful uh, what you said really is. So I mentioned earlier that uh, there's several genetic mutations that took place in areas that have had a strong association with dairy for a long period of time. Um, Europe, uh, places in Europe, and, and, and certainly places, a few places in Africa. Um, and they developed lactose tolerance into adulthood. Well, in Mongolia, you, it is what on the surface seems like a strange phenomenon. They have a huge uh, component of dairy in their diet, and they consume quite a bit of dairy. Um, yak dairy, camel dairy, uh, sheep dairy, a lot, lot of different dairy. Uh, but they have a very high rate of lactose intolerance as adults. In fact, it's really, really high. I mean, almost at a Native American level, which is Native American level, since they never had uh, dairy in their diets prehistorically at any meaningful level, it's, it's really close to 100% lactose intolerance. So it's a really high level of lactose. Lactose intolerance, that's quite almost, important. Almost 100%, it's yeah, very high. Most people don't tolerate lactose and it's right. normal. The, and it's normal to, and, and that's very normal. It's very normal. Again, the yeah. weird thing is that some of us had ancestors that had struck such a strong association with dairy that we um, created this mutation spontaneously happened. And, and it isn't the same mutation in Europe as it is in Africa. They independently happen. They're different mutations. But regardless, here we are in Mongolia where dairy is a major component of their diets. And you have this huge percentage of lactose intolerance. What's the deal? Well, they don't drink milk. They always ferment it. They're making fermented yak butter. They make all sorts of fermented cheeses. They do all of those things, but they don't drink a glass of milk. They never needed to, um, you know, they, they never needed to be able to uh, deal with the lactose as an adult. Because and here's the other part, and I'm sorry, I, this was missing from the conversation. The fermentation of the dairy um, is controlled by the lactobacillus bacteria that eat lactose as food and produce lactic acid. So the longer you're fermenting the dairy, the more food that's consumed by the bacteria and the food is the lactose is the sugar. So the, the uh, amount of lactose in that fermented food is, is much lower um, uh -huh. than it was in the original dairy. So a drinking, if you have a glass of milk, this, this much milk, and it has a certain amount of lactose in it. If you ferment that into something else, kefir, clabber, yogurt, cheese, that uh, there's either very little or no lactose left because it's all been eaten up. So if you, if you make yogurt and you ferment it for 24 hours, there's no lactose left in it whatsoever. It's naturally lactose free. When it comes to other dairy, I'm in my head, I think of mozzarella when we see these cheeses like triple brie cheese, camembert. Number one, one, one of the things you can look for is if it's, if it's a traditional cheese, if it's, if it's a cheese that's been around for a very long time, um, and it's made by a quality producer, it's a safe bet to at least assume that it's made in a traditional way and it's been through the fermentation process. Anything that says cheese food, cheese product, cheese-like, whatever, um, you know, things like Velveeta or, or the American cheese, or the, those sorts of things, they, they're terrible and stay away from them. They've not, number one, a lot of times they've had emulsified, uh, you know, industrial nut and seed oils, into them and emulsified them. And, and a lot of times it has been through the fermentation. All, there, there's a lot of reasons to stay away from that. But the one you, you brought up is a good one. And I'll just spend a second on it. But um, I think we've already dove deep enough into the discussion so that everybody listening can understand uh, the situation with, with mozzarella. Mozzarella is a weird one. Um, mozzarella, in order to make mozzarella, you need to start with milk, get it fermenting, uh, add the rennet or that enzyme that allows it to coagulate and allow it to ferment for, down to an exact pH of about 5.2, uh, somewhere between 4.9 and 5.2. Now, any, I know, again, this is, this is outside of what people think about pH. What are you talking about? P, the pH scale, right? Seven is neutral. So seven is water. Anything above it is alkaline or basic and anything below it is acidic. And the lower the number, the more acidic it is. Now, remember the lactobacillus bacteria are eating the lactose and producing lactic acid. So the more lactose it eats and the longer amount of time it has to do it, 
um, the more lactic acid that's produced, so it's more acidic and the pH is dropped. So milk starts to the pH of about 6.8, just a hair acidic from, from neutral. And if we started fermenting over a period, and it depends on a couple of things, but over a period of somewhere between five, six, seven, eight, sometimes nine hours, um, the lactobacillus bacteria are eating the lactose, producing lactic acid, and it reaches a pH of around 5.2. And when it reaches that pH, we can heat it up and stretch it. And if any, if you ever seen a video of it, or make, if you, you stretch the cheese and you make mozzarella and provolone and a whole bunch of other cheeses that fall under that category of stretch curd cheeses. The cool thing is, yeah, it's fermented. It's, it's gone through the process. It's, it, it's exactly what we're looking for. And when it reaches that 5.2, we stretch it, make mozzarella and a real bowl of mozzarella made just like that is, it falls directly in line with everything we've just talked about for the last half an hour. And I would say, have at it, have as much as you eat. It's, it's, it's good. You're good to go. But here's the problem with mozzarella. Most of the modern food industry around the world has found a shortcut and it doesn't go through the fermentation process. Instead of allowing it to ferment for all of those hours and go through the chemical and physical changes, that the, the good ones that it goes through for that time, they can change the pH and instantly by adding something acidic citric acid, lactic acid, acetic acid, which is vinegar. If you add any of those things, you can nail that pH 5.2 moment, it, it, literally in an instant and start and, and stretch your cheese right away. It wow. looks like mozzarella. It smells like mozzarella. It tastes kind of like mozzarella, um, but it's not. And unfortunately, mo even really high end cheeses that are in a bowl that are sitting in the liquid and they're really expensive and they have the Italian colors on it, maybe even some Italian words on it and all these things. Um, it, it, a lot of it is not real cheese and, and, and it will fake you. So if you are lactose intolerant and you want to eat that cheese and you get the wrong version of it, you might as well just drink a glass of milk and suffer all the consequences of all the lactose that's there. Because all the lactose that was originally in the milk is still in the milk. There's been no fermentation. There was no loss of the lactose whatsoever. The real mozzarella, on the other hand, has very little lactose in it because it's been eaten by the lactobacillus bacteria. So if you're lactose intolerant, you want to eat mozzarella cheese, go to the store, pick up the package of mozzarella. Don't be fooled by how it looks or how it's labeled or any of that. Just turn it over and look at the ingredients. And if it says anything acidic on it, citric acid, lactic acid, acetic acid, vinegar, which is the same thing. If it says any of those on it, turn it over and put it right back because it hasn't been through the fermentation process. If it says live active cultures or something like that on it, then yes, that's exactly what you're looking for. It used the fermentation to change the pH to get to the right place to actually make the cheese. And, and the real problem is with pizza. If you're, you know, because you don't have that ability to look at the, you know, look at the package to see if it was fake or not. So if you're ordering pizza, you need to find out, either make the cheese yourself or find out if, um, the, the pizzeria is using real mozzarella cheese that's been through that process. Because if they're not, you might as well just skip the pizza and drink a glass of milk because you're getting the same the same thing out of it. But even eating a pizza, isn't the wheat and all the processed junk oh. in pizza worse? <laughs> well, there's a lot of mozzarella. reasons not to eat it. <laughs> One of the things that we do here, at the, I, you, you're right. Uh, because I, when most of the people listening to this are picturing pizza, they're picturing something completely different than what I'm picturing. We make, we, we spend an entire week here in the modern Stone Age kitchen making uh, pizza for one day. We uh, do 100% sourdough crust that we ferment for three days. We make real mozzarella cheese and we make, well, we make everything, but we, including, we make all the meats that go on top. So we butcher the pigs. We make all the Italian sausage in house. We make all the pepperoni in house. There's no artificial anything going in any of it. Um, and so if you don't eat wheat at all, fine. If you do, um, certainly sourdough, in my mind, is the safest, most nourishing way to consume grains. And uh, it, you can get a pizza here that might look like the pizza down the road, but it is literally a completely different food because you, we're doing everything that we can to use those traditional and ancestral technologies to transform those raw ingredients into their safest and most nourishing forms possible. And sourdough is one of them. I wouldn't tell anyone who's not consuming dairy at all to start consuming dairy because you need to. You don't need to. If you are going to consume dairy, the ways that we just talked about are the safest and most nourishing ways to include dairy in your diets. And I do believe they can be a part of a healthy, modern, adult human diet. And they are in ours. 
I would never tell anybody who's not eating grains to start eating grains. They are not essential to our diets whatsoever. However, if you are going to consume grains, there's a much safer way to go about doing it. If it's things like wheat, then a true sourdough process is, in my mind, the safest, most nourishing way. Just like with the cheese, the problem is there's so many loopholes, there's so many marketing schemes. There's, you can't trust the sourdough bread in the grocery store. There's no, I don't know of anywhere in the world, the government food agency has a requirement for calling something sourdough. And I know for sure the FDA does it here. Um, they, they do the same thing. They take just regular plain yeasted bread and they add something sour to it to make it seem like a sourdough, and, but it hasn't been through the chemical and physical processes that, that transform the grains in a safer, safer, more nourishing form. So you either have to know your baker or make it yourself, but it's, it's very accessible and very easy to do. But and that, that's what I mean. So again, you, you, I must say, don't go start eating bread. No, if no. you're going to eat bread or feed bread to your kids, there's an, a much safer way to do it than most of the world is doing it right now. Same thing with the dairy. Uh, it's, and, and there's the problem with the plant world. You know, every single plant on this planet has toxins. All of them do. Some are benign and don't really hurt us. Some will kill us outright or make us very sick quickly. And many of them will build up in our bodies over time. Things like oxalates, which can cause much damage over, over uh, months and years and, and decades. And if, we're, if you look at the technologies in the past over millions of years uh, that were created, most of the technologies that have to do with consuming animals had to do with getting the animal, right? We had to overcome our physical limitations to access that animal, to get at it, to take it down, to hunt it, to have things fly through the air and take it down at a distance. I mean, that's what we had to do. And then we just needed a sharp edge to open it up. Once we have a fresh dead animal opened up in front of us, you don't have to do anything to it. I mean, that's a pile of incredible, safe, bioavailable, nutrient-dense food. You, in most cases, you don't even have to cook it. But vegetables are something different. Most of the technologies that we've created through time to deal with the plant world, um, up until agriculture, right, were all, because agriculture, you know, planting and harvesting and all that work. But up until that time, we're all focused on how to take these unsafe and inaccessible, nutrient inaccessible foods and make them safe and make the nutrients available to our bodies. Things like fermentation and cooking and drying and slicing, all, all of those things, which are uh, nishtamalizing, uh, which are uh, so incredibly important. Soaking and sprouting and sourdough, all, all of that is incredibly important. And, and, and the role, what we have to do to most of our, uh, most of the plant world is A, make them safe for us and B, make the nutrients in them available to our bodies. How do we make the plants, especially now safe for us and nutrient available for us? I've spent about 20 years um, researching how to detox, how traditional ways of detoxifying plants. And there's a lot of ways to do it. It depends on, and there's no like, this is what you do because it depends on the plant, it depends on the toxin, it depends on the season, it depends on several different things. The, the good news is um, if you care to spend the time doing it, there's ways to make many plants much safer for us. Um, Fermentate, and it, it, it isn't, it, it depends on the plant, it depends on the toxin. So things like uh, potatoes, for example, can be fermented. If potatoes are inherently incredibly dangerous, by the way, but you can do, they, they full are like alkaloids. Oh my gosh, yes, terrible. Really? Um, and the ancestors, the wild, the potatoes first domesticated about 8,000 years ago, and the wild ancestor was incredibly dangerous. And most of the early domesticated versions were incredibly dangerous as well. Um, the toxins that are in those heirloom varieties, first of all, those heirloom varieties are still grown in places like Bolivia and Peru, where the potato was first domesticated. Um, but those toxins in the more contemporary versions of potatoes that you can find in the grocery store are still present at lower levels, but are still present. And first of all, you have to understand that those toxins are there. And secondly, you uh, need to realize when they're really, really bad and powerful. So an, an improperly stored potato the, uh, can, the improperly stored potato can increase the toxic load in that potato. And a great way to tell is if it, um, if it starts to get green at all, a greenish tinge on it, 
get rid of the potato. Don't cut it out. Don't don't pretend that it's not there. Don't just peel it. Get rid of that potato. It is not fit for human consumption any longer. People end up in the hospital every year from poisoning from potatoes. Don't ever eat a raw potato. And no matter what your parents told you, the most toxic part of a potato is the skin. Peel the potato always. Um, but again, uh, there's a lot of these potatoes that are still grown, harvested, and consumed in places like Bolivia and Peru up in the Andes. And they are intensively processed to detoxify them and make the nutrients available. So sometimes it's, it's uh, leaching in rivers and freeze drying it to make something called chuno or uh, eating it with clay to make something called pasa, which is where the clay binds with the toxins and pass through our bodies um, or fermenting it. I um, uh, forget the word of uh, what it's called when it's fermented, but uh, fermenting it for like six months in the ground. The good news is you can ferment a, a peeled potato, you know, cut up into, into say French fries or potato chip size in, in just several days and really make them safer. But here's, the, so for many plant toxins, there's things you can do, except the one toxin that I haven't found yet a viable solution for detoxifying is oxalates. I There's knew some it. suggestion, some suggestion <laughs> yeah. that fermentation can help a little, but not at a meaningful level. So if, if um, you have an issue with oxalates or are weary about oxalates and you should be because they're incredibly dangerous, then the best thing to do is uh, eat those foods that have high oxalate contents in moderation or skip them all together. When you reconnect with your food and take links out of the food chain, you realize just like when we were talking about the liver, the organ meats earlier, some of this is are problems that we've created through the modern food industry. If I said to you, you know, if, if you were planting a garden and you had spinach in your garden and said you were only allowed to eat the stuff that came out of your garden, then you would eat spinach and you might eat quite a bit of spinach, but you'd eat spinach for two weeks when it was ready in your garden. And then the rest of the year, you would eat no spinach. So now that we, we've labeled spinach as superfood and we make it available in the grocery stores 365 days out of the year, and some of us are making spinach shakes in the morning and eating a spinach salad for lunch every day of the year, yes. it's, it's, it's something you could have never done before. The other limiting mechanism, like with nuts, I mean, if I said to you, uh, you know, go collect the almonds under the almond tree, take off the holes, crack open the shells, pull out the almond and eat the almonds. You can have as many as you want. You'd be eating a few every day. But we, we you know, we have these big box stores and you can buy shelled almonds for $10, a bag of them and sit there and eat them all day long. And it doesn't even hurt your paycheck. You know, you hurt your wallet anymore. Yeah. And we've taken away some of those limiting mechanisms. We've created this problem. And so, you know, if you have an oxalate issue, I, I have a huge issue with oxalates. I avoid spinach at all costs. But for normal people, it's probably not a big deal if you eat spinach the two weeks out of the year that it's available. Mm. But it's a huge deal if you eat it every single day of the year. How can people find you, Bill? Okay. Well, there's a couple places. So um, my family and I have a foodery called the Modern Stone Age Kitchen, and you can find us at my, uh, www.modernstoneagekitchen.com. There's a ton of information on there about the food we produce and a lot of resources as well. My personal website is uh, eatlikeahuman.com and on social media at Dr. Bill Schindler, so at Dr. Bill Schindler and at Modern Stone Age Kitchen. Wonderful. And obviously, and my, and my book is out. I believe it's in, in Australia yes. as well. Eat like, yes. Eat like a human. Yeah. 